Good evening. Uh, my name is Jack Lewis and I'm the Executive Director at One for the World. We ask people to pledge 1% of their income to Give Wells charities. Actually, of course, what we think is you should give what you can. But if you haven't tried effective giving before, or you're not sure if you can afford it, or you're not sure that this is what you want to do with all of your charitable giving, we think 1% is a great place to start to see whether it suits you. Because we believe all of us can live on 99% of our income. I'm delighted to be joined this evening by Professor Michael Kramer, who is one of the world's most influential development economists. He is a pioneer behind both the research methods and the actual research that has led to many of the recommendations that you've heard about this evening. He's going to run you through some of his most consequential work, so I won't steal his thunder, but it is fair to say that he has produced several of the most important studies in the field of development economics. And he's going to a 15 minute presentation about his career, but a big part of this evening is you getting the opportunity to ask questions of Professor Kramer. So please use the chat function on YouTube. Those questions will come to me and I'll try to get through as many as I can. But for now, Professor Kramer, thank you so much for being with us. Great, thank you so much. Um, what I try to do today is describe a little bit about the uh, the experimental approach in development economics, which uh, is what uh, Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duflo, and I uh, received last year's Nobel Prize for in economics, and then give a few examples to, to illustrate um, those features and to explain why I think that the approach is, is useful for policy, uh, for uh, including for private individuals um, so, uh, thinking about how to allocate charitable funds, why well, it's useful for science, although I probably won't go into that so much, um, and why it's useful as a source of innovation. And then after going through those examples, I'll say a little bit about the need uh, and some evidence on the impact of institutions to try to support, uh, support innovation using the experimental method uh, for, for development. I'm in a bit of trouble advancing my slides here. Let's go. There we go. Okay. So the um, you know, I think when for those of you who have some familiarity with the uh, with the uh, with development economics and with the experimental approach, um, I think the first thing people think about, and certainly the uh, the reason I got initially got excited about this approach, and um, was because it provides a way of getting that causal impact. So let me explain you know, what I mean by that. You know, traditionally in, in social science, uh, it's very difficult to isolate the impact of a program from potential confounding factors. So if you're trying to understand what's the impact of going to a private school as opposed to a public school, that's very difficult. Kids who go to private school differ in all sorts of ways from kids who go to public school. How do you disentangle the impact? Economists and, and others have come up with all sorts of interesting and, and often useful statistical approaches to dealing with this. But you know, the, the basic idea of the experimental approach, at least initially, was to try to do what is done, for example, in medicine, of have a randomized controlled trial. And so, for example, if there's a private school or that has a limited number of slots available uh, through scholarships, to if there's a lottery to allocate that, which sometimes there is for fairness reasons, compare the winners and losers of that lottery. And then on average, winners and losers should be similar on other characteristics, except whether they had the opportunity to go to, to the private school. And then that would allow um, an estimate of the impact of the private school on, on whatever outcome you're interested in, uh, test scores, wages uh, later on, et cetera. So I think that's that's certainly how I initially thought about the experimental approach. But I think it turned out to have much broader applicability and it led to, a, I think, a, a change in the way that economists do research. And ironically, some of these changes were things that were initially seen as constraints imposed by the experimental method. The first one was, you know, if you, if you think about analyzing 
stereotype of economists is they get a data set somebody else has collected and they analyze it using various statistical methods. That's, that can be a very useful technique, but it doesn't involve a lot of time in the field talking to, talking to, the, to the, the human beings involved in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the particular context you're looking at. And the experimental approach, the researcher has to spend a lot of time with um, you know, students, with teachers, with, with uh, school administrators, with government officials or NGO officials. Um, if they're trying to evaluate a program, uh, they need to do all of that. They need to design questionnaires. They need to pretest the questionnaires. All of that involves a lot of interaction, and that interaction provides a much richer set of context. Uh, so, um, you know, in a way, it's moving economists to be more like some other so qualitative social scientists who, who who think that type of context is very important. And, and I think they're they're. Right. Um, another factor about um, about the experimental approach is it often involves taking on specific practical problems. And again, this was sometimes seen as a disadvantage. Okay, you're looking at the impact of textbooks on test scores, but we need to get at much larger questions, and you're only asking a very answering a very specific question. People saw that as a disadvantage. I think what we found is that by looking at specific practical problems in a way that provides evidence that's as clear cut, and obviously nothing in life is completely clear, clear cut, but as, as relatively clear cut as, uh, as evidence from randomized controlled trials, you're forced to confront some issues which might not have been in your theoretical framework to begin with. And that may require you to, to go back from the data and think about your theory, and in some cases, uh, realize that your theory needs revision and that you, you need to uh, you need to develop a new theory. And you know, I won't discuss it here due to time constraints, but um, I, in fact, did a study on textbooks, which sounds like a sort of boring question with an obvious answer. And certainly the, the, um, the, the obviously textbooks have to have to help uh, in a context where a few kids have textbooks. Um, the attempts to use statistical controls tended to indicate that it, that when we actually did the study, we found results that were at some variance from that. And, uh, and I think that points both to the importance of really isolating causal impact. But in that case, that also led us to think about the theory and, um, and, and come up with, with uh, some new theoretical ideas. So that's the, the third element. Fourth element of this is it's inherently collaborative. Um, collaborative between researchers and practitioners, because you're typically working with an NGO or a government or a private firm. And, and it's collaborative between different types of researchers. If it's education research, you're working with educationalists often. And I think that brings a lot of ideas into economics that might not otherwise have been there in a, in a way that I think is very valuable. And then finally, it's iterative. There can be rapid, rapid cycles. You get one result, you see something that you thought worked, didn't work. So you try something else, you see something worked, but then you say, well, which elements drove it? You know, this was a costly program with five different elements. Which one drives the results? Or you see something had an effect different than what you might think from the existing theory, and you design a new experiment to, to test the theory. And then in an iteration taps, and it's not just within research teams, but also across research teams. Um, so I think these five characteristics, which I'll you know, maybe try to illustrate a little with some examples, makes this very useful for policy, including, including the decisions of private individuals about how to allocate their, their philanthropic funds. But I think it makes things useful for science. So I'm happy to discuss that in Q&A if it comes up. But one thing I'd like to emphasize, which I don't think has been emphasized enough, is I think it makes experimental method a very useful tool for innovation, these five features. So let me give some, some concrete examples. So one is on school-based e-learning. So one of the, the first evaluations I was involved in was um, not, not the first, you know, for example, the textbook one came, came earlier, but this was an, an evaluation of a very small NGO which was running a deworming program. They'd initially tried some other things, but then they decided they were gonna try deworming. Um, so roughly as background, nearly 1 billion people worldwide are at risk of intestinal worms. 
and they're particularly common among school-aged children. So the World Health Organization has recommended that in endemic areas, would be school-based mass treatment. The medicine's very cheap, safe, um, but it's pretty expensive to diagnose kids. So they recommend just doing mass treatment. So, um, so this NGO decided it was gonna try this, initially in 25 schools, then another 25, then a third group of 25. Um, and they staggered the rollout over time for logistical reasons. It was a really small NGO. Before they'd only worked in seven schools at a time. Um, and, the, the, um, and so we could use the staggered rollout to measure the impact of the program. And we saw that school absences dropped by roughly a quarter. Moreover, there were spillover effects on untreated children and on children in nearby schools. Um, the disease uh, spreads through fecal contamination, which then can get into the soil or into the water. And uh, um, you know, some of that spread of the eggs uh, was, was um, you know, it seems was um, interrupted, not fully interrupted, partially interrupted. And we, we then, we've been following these, um, these students who are in this program and now for 20 years, and they're, so they're now adults. And we see that people are earning more and consuming, consuming more. You know, economists tend to use, uh, often in developing countries, we realize it's easier to measure consumption than income. In any case, either way, these numbers look uh, pretty similar either way. And that's a, because the medication is incredibly cheap, and even the administration, when delivered through schools, is very cheap. Um, you know, the, the long run earnings were enough to pay for the program 100 times over. So, um, so we, we found these, you know, you know, I think very impressive results. Since then, um, the, the NGO Evidence Action has gotten uh, very involved in this. And, and it, it, its mode of operating is to work with governments. And governments have been, been, and, um, have been persuaded. Uh, um, so Evidence Action is now partnering with governments to reach over 280 million children a year. In India and in Kenya and Nigeria, Pakistan, uh, the cost is less than 50 cents per, per child per year. That's all inclusive delivery costs as well as the um, medicine costs. The medicine itself is extremely cheap. Um, so that's you know that's one example. Now that's a that's an example that is you know, one particular thing. That's a you know I think relevant for policy. But you can say, well, you know, what do we learn from from science? For science from that. One thing that, here's something that turned out to be a quite general pattern. So there's a general issue of what's the impact of charging for preventive health. And I think the model that a lot of economists uh, were trained in, certainly when, you know, when I was in graduate school, which predated the rise of behavioral economics, was that you know, individual consumers, if something's worthwhile, individual consumers will, will buy it unless there's an externality. In this case, there is an externality, but you still might think that individuals would buy the deworming medicine. Now, the program that I just told you about was a free program. The NGO, um, and I, I don't want to just blame economists for this. This was very common among, among NGOs as well. People thought it was really important to charge fees for, charge at least something or else people wouldn't value uh, um, things they got for free. What we found was that, so we worked with the NGO, we persuaded them to try some try it for free in some places. And we saw that even a small fee dramatically reduced uptake, down to 17% from 70% when it was free. Um, I think the only reason was 70% rather than much higher was because it was part of a research study, people had to sign to give permission and um, so there was some effort involved. Um, but this pattern of dramatic reductions in uptake in response to small fees has been found in other preventive and, and uh, health contexts. Um, and um, bed nets, water treatment, and so on. And that's, I think, led to some thinking about what are the factors behind that and some scientific progress. It's also led to a broader policy change inexpensive preventive health products are increasingly provided for free. Let me talk about one example where, which is unfortunately a sector that's lagging in this, so there's still a fair amount of effort to charge. Um, so this is a sort of a second area of research. Um, this is uh, on water. So diarrheal disease from contaminated water is a, a big source of, of child death. Um, 
Kenya, for example, it's an, ought to be the number two source of child death. Um, we look initially, and this will give you a sense of the iteration, an NGO evaluated an NGO project that was um, trying to encase open spring water sources in concrete to reduce contamination. And we did see the contamination fell, fell by two thirds of the source. But then when we tested people's water at home, it was only a one third reduction. And turns out a lot of that was because the water got recontaminated in storage or transport. The diarrhea rates still fell, they fell by a quarter, but not as much as you would have liked. But one thing you can do to address that is to treat the water uh, with, for example, with chlorine, that, that keeps the water safe for a while. The chlorine stays in the water, reacts with any microorganisms in there. The problem is that the way that chlorine was being distributed is it was being sold in small bottles that cost about 20 or 30 cents for a month's supply. Um, and only about 7% of the population was buying those in this area at that time. We tried to think about, well, how can we design a solution to this using ideas and insights from behavioral economics. So one, you won't be surprised for what I said, was we wanted to make this free. We also wanted to make this as convenient as possible. Uh, we wanted it to be salient to, to provide a reminder um, and to be help, help people in forming habits. We wanted it to be public so people could ask other people about it, so maybe social norms could form around it. We developed this approach of the chlorine dispensers, which you see in the picture. Um, these are uh, containers with the same water treatment solution that are put in by the water point. So where people are going to collect their water anyway. So this, this led to an increase in treatment from 7% to 50%, somewhat more, you know, roughly 50%, a little bit more. Um, that, um, that, that provides clean water for now for, it's been scaled up also by evidence action, uh, provides clean water for 2 million people in Kenya, Uganda, and Malawi. Um, that's, that's a give all standout charity. Um, costs about $1.50 per person per year. It's, um, they're getting 55% uh, uh, usage rates. And you know, they ask, their estimate is this prevents over 450,000 cases of diarrhea. We're just about to bring out a paper that looks at the impact of this on child survival. Um, and it looks like we're finding very large effects on child survival. There's a, like any study, there's some qualifications. So, uh, but, um, but it, it looks like um, you know, very, very large effects, um, making it very, very cost effective in, in saving lives. We have another example, not from the health, but from a, an agriculture example. Um, this is something where I'd, I'd been doing research on um, digital messages to provide farmers with information. And um, this is something that um, we were finding positive results on. A colleague, I was working in Kenya, a colleague was working in India, also finding positive results. And I was approached by a philanthropist who, who was looking for, said, you know, pitch me something. So told him about our results. Uh, he encouraged us to, um, to to set up an organization to address this. So we founded an NGO uh, together with others called uh, Precision Development. And it initially worked in agriculture, now it also works in education. Recently did a, had an article come out in Science that evaluated the, not just the impact of Precision Development's work, but of digital agricultural extension more broadly. And what we found was that the, there were, um, we combined many different studies and, and uh, showed that this affects behavior and, uh, and also evidence of, the, of an impact on farm yields, profits. Although that, that evidence is, uh, there's not many studies on that. So um, um, that evidence isn't quite as uh, strong, statistically speaking, in terms of statistical significance. But in each case, the magnitudes of these effects are sort of tenfold uh, the cost of the program. So um, the, um, um, the you know, I think this is also a, a very good investment. The, um, and I think that those, I think it's likely to get much better over time because precision development and, and others are using A-B testing to improve these systems over time. The technology is getting better and better as more and more people get smartphones, for example. You can do things like 
provide video or get uh, farmers take pictures of pests and send those back to be at to, so that they can be identified and recommendations can be given. So precision development is also working with governments in uh, India, Pakistan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, um, Nigeria now, um, I believe Brazil will start soon in Brazil. Um, and, um, and I think it's, it's, again, using the same approach of basing, basing things on evidence, using A-B testing to continually improve, and then working with governments, it's been able to achieve a uh, quite, quite strong scale. And it's, it was just a few days ago named to, to give well standout chair. I think these examples to illustrate how the experimental method can be useful in generating practical, scalable innovations. I don't want to give the wrong idea, by the way. There are lots of things that don't work. I gave you the textbook example uh, earlier. Um, I, you know, um, I think if you think about the, um, so I think you, you want to pay attention to the evidence. Um, um, you know, some things, textbooks are a great example, but common sense or even the available Non-experimental evidence suggests have a big impact. Um, the story turns out to be um, more complicated when you when you when you start doing getting experimental evidence. Um, one thing I would note is if you think about the private sector, Google, Facebook, Amazon, they're running A/B tests using the experimental method all the time. You know, constantly tweaking their systems to get them to optimize them to to make as much profit as possible. That's the same type of process that's used to you know, get as many people to buy from Amazon as possible. That approach could be used to better deliver information to farmers or to uh, for, you know, improve, uh, improve, create educational opportunities for kids who can't get regular schooling because of COVID. Uh, there's a, a thousand things that could be done, but that won't be done on its own because the profit opportunities aren't, aren't the same. And that's, why I think we need public or philanthropic funding, and we also need institutions for this. So I'd like to say a little bit about that sort of broader issue beyond sort of the individual uh, examples. So I helped co-found a fund within USAID called Development Innovation Ventures, um, and that provides open funding to support innovation across you know, different sources of innovation, you know, private firms, researchers, NGOs, uh, across sectors, so uh, across geographies, and across scaling approaches, both things that would scale commercially and things that would scale through adoption by the public sector. We have a pretty broad definition of innovation. Our approach to sort of discipline our funding is that we have a rules-based approach. We give small amounts of funding for piloting, larger amounts, but still fairly modest for testing. And then the larger scale funding comes in only after other strong evidence. So, that was the approach, and that's designed to transition things to scale because it's not typically enough just to have the research results. So the, the um, you know, we're, that's been around for about 10 years. By the way, I should say, it's, if, you, if you're interested, in, some of you may be innovators out there, uh, please go on the web, look us up, and, and uh, feel free to submit an application if, if you think there's a good match there. Um, the, um, so, because we've been around for 10 years, it takes time for innovations to scale, but we thought, let's look at our early portfolio, uh, 2010 through 12, and see what our track record is. So here, this chart sort of shows the, the, um, the impact of the innovations. So there are 41 innovations in that early portfolio. So if you look at the first, uh, you know, 30 of them, you don't, or even, you don't see that much, they haven't reached that many people. And that's typical when you're funding innovation. Most, most uh, a large fraction of the total benefit is going to come from a small fraction of the projects. You know, that would be true if you're a venture capital fund. You know, you know, you're not going to make money on everything. But if you get a Google or Facebook in there, you're going to make, you're going to do well. Well, looks like the same thing is true for social innovation. So these are, these are, these are the nine innovations that went over a million, which I think is actually a great track record relative to the sector. I think is in part because of the um, involvement with researchers and the use of the experimental method. A lot of these successful ones uh, use that. And we've done some very basic statistical analysis of 
of what are the predictors of scale, um, those things are seem to be associated with scale. And there's some other factors as well, like just inexpensive innovations are more likely to scale. But aside from this, that question of scaling, really what we care about is what are the benefits and what's the ratio of benefits to cost? So the, the amount that we, was spent uh, by the US government on this was $16 million on those in this first couple of years. We've, we're not able to get good estimates of the benefits for every innovation, but we looked at out of those 40, 41 uh, innovations, 43 grants, uh, we looked at just five projects where we were able, that had reached over a million users and where we could get the data. And we see that the benefits of this, uh, these are our latest numbers, which aren't the official numbers. Uh, I hope to bring them out soon, a new set of numbers soon, but um, we did an analysis about a year ago and, uh, and what I'm showing you now is our updated numbers. Uh, so uh, with that important uh, asterisk on it, um, looks like the uh, social benefits pay for the cost of the portfolio 17 times over. Um, the cost per person reached was just 16 cents. So I think this is just a fantastic uh, investment, this type of um, institution to support innovation. Just to conclude, I think um, what I'd like to stress is that experiments can isolate causal impact, but they're also useful tools for innovation. But you know, we need to invest in that innovation and we need, we need funds for that, but we also need institutions for it. And I, I, just a couple of months ago, I accepted a new job where I'm now at the University of Chicago, that's where I'm talking from. And I came here in large part to help start a development innovation lab here, which is going to, um, which is going to work to use these types of tools to uh, to create innovations for the developing world. And uh, if people are are interested in this field, you know, happy to to, to follow up um, uh, by you know, um, take any questions now, but also to follow up afterwards separately. So thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Kramer. That was really interesting. And we've had some fantastic questions coming in through the chat. Um, I'd like to start with one from Sophie, who said, um, could you comment on the value of donating to support the type of research that you're describing versus donating to charities that have been shown to be effective from that research? You know, I think they're, um, no, this is not gonna be a super satisfactory answer. Um, I think they're both, they're both, um, they can both have a huge impact. You know, I, I mentioned uh, evidence action as one, or precision agriculture, or precision development as two organizations. I think they're, I'm, I should disclose, by the way, I'm on the board of precision development. Um, um, so, um, but um, I think they're both great organizations um, and, and that would be a, a very effective use of, of, of funds. I also think that um, sustaining this type of, of research is also very important. Um, and there are a number of organizations that do that. Um, uh, Poverty Action Lab at MIT, um, Harvard has uh, evidence for policy design. You know, we've just started the lab here at Chicago. Um, um, uh, Berkeley has, uh, uh, sorry, University of California more broadly, uh, not just Berkeley has uh, something called SEGA. Um, so there are a number of great, um, great organizations. I don't mean to just focus on four US institutions, there are other ones as well. But I, I won't keep listing acronyms. Fantastic. Um, another really good question from Jesper, who says, um, how well does this scientific approach translate to settings with extremely high degrees of uncertainty, such as some of the animal welfare causes that we heard about earlier this evening? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, So, well, let me let me first say things where you know I think this probably couldn't well be couldn't be used. I think there are things like you know people are worried about um, um, an asteroid hitting the Earth or about um, artificial and you know negative impacts of artificial intelligence and really dystopian scenarios. I don't I don't have a way of assessing assessing those things. Um, um, so I, it's hard for me to comment. Animal welfare, um, you know, there might actually be some cases where we could, um, you know, if you wanted to understand, I'm making this up, I'm not an expert in the field, but if you wanted to understand, well, what's the impact of a, 
of a particular type of education campaign and getting people to switch from uh, to become vegetarian or to switch from factory farmed uh, um, meat to uh, free range chickens or something, you know, you might be able to assess the impact of of, the, of that. Um, I think you could, in principle. How do right, maybe? No way, no way that randomized trials can tell you how you should, what, what value you should put on each, you know, that you have to ask the philosophers for advice of, or look in your heart. Or, yeah. Maybe an area for, for the research and thought then. Um, Shiri has raised a couple of the potential ethical issues with randomized control trials. And in particular, the use of RCTs, mainly in a development economic context, where we might not be happy to use them in the context of developed countries. Um, can you speak to those ethical concerns and also what you can do to safeguard against them? Um, so, you know, I think randomized trials um, also are, are can and are used in, to address problems in higher income countries as well. So um, there's a whole set of RCTs. I mean, I mentioned that, that um, well, there are a whole set of RCTs on, try on savings behavior, on working with, um, you know, they're, they're working to examine, so in this sort of a US example, the US, um, a lot of savings is done through uh, pension plans and employer employees contribute and then employers might match that. And there are different, and but employees have to enroll in these plans. And there've been different attempts to look at a whole set of, of, uh, of, of different ways to try to increase employee savings rates and to get uh, people to adopt more uh, efficient savings. So I think, that, I think that these can be used for problems affecting uh, developed countries as well as uh, you know, high income countries, as well as low and middle income countries. But um, fundamentally, I think we've got important social problems and it's important to try to find ways to address them and some of sometimes things that we think are effective turn out not to be and things that we um we, we don't realize are so effective turn out to be extraordinarily effective so trying to get evidence on that is important now obviously in the process of doing that you have to be concerned about uh about human subjects and the rights of, of human subjects and they're you know all of these um, experiments, um, well, there's procedures to go through and universities have review boards and the institutions in developing countries set up their own review boards. And typically um, these evaluations will go through both procedures, both in the country where they're taking place, wherever that is, and in the university of the researchers uh, um, that the researchers are working. Okay, thank you. Um, there are some more great questions we're not going to have time for, um, but I just wanted to finish by talking about your own giving. You have taken the Giving What We Can pledge to give away 10% or more of your income for your whole career. So I wondered if you could tell us why you wanted to do that and also which organizations you support with your own giving. Yeah, um, so you know, why did I want to do that? Fundamentally, because the money can make such a difference and it can clearly have so much, you know, as I think some of these examples illustrate and they're, they're not unique. Um, there are ways, you know, a, a dollar or a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars can go a lot farther and, and improve so many more lives, so much more, um, uh, with so much more uh, impact in a lower income setting than in certainly in, in, than it would for me um, if I spent on, on, you know, my, on, on myself uh, or, or even you know, my family. And, the, um, and then which organizations actually, you know, I've given to Evidence Act, all of the organizations uh, here to Evidence, mentioned it today, I've given uh, substantial amounts to, to Evidence Action on both, both you know, deworming and, and water. Um, uh, to precision, uh, to precision development, um, and also to support um, you know, academic research, which um, which is tied to to these objectives, and which is is um, um, so. You know, I think the I guess the 
most recent uh, uh, and, and, you know, large gift was um, Esther Abajid and I decided that we were going to give the funds that came from our uh, from the Nobel Prize to support um, support really the next generation of researchers in this in this area. Um, and we gave to something called the Weiss Fund, um, which is supported uh, in part by the, in, in much larger amounts by the Weiss family. And um, that's, it's administered, administered through the University of Chicago, um, but it's designed to provide funding to, you know, primarily to, it's a little bit broader than this, but primarily to uh, junior faculty and graduate students doing this type of research, but very specifically for things that are, um, not research for research's sake alone, but research that's oriented towards improving the lives of the poor, of poor people in poor countries. And you know, the emphasis of this, uh, to some extent, the program had been just a US program, but with the gift and with this very large uh, increased gift from the Weiss family, um, it's, it's now being broadened out globally and in particular to developing countries. Uh, so the researchers from around the world can, can participate. Fantastic. Well, uh, Professor Kramer, thank you so much for your time this evening. Uh, One for the World and many of the organisations that we've heard from tonight rely on your research and the methods that you've pioneered all the time. So we really do appreciate it. Your contribution to the field is uh, fantastic, as was recognised with your Nobel Prize last year. Um, thank you very much to everyone who submitted questions. And I think now we're going to hear from Charlie Bressler to round off this evening. Thank you.